So we've had a chance to hear from a number of different counties talking about some of their projects. And then we had a chance to hear about some research and some measurement of impact and cost benefit. And now we're going to go back to the question that was raised this morning about what are we trying to achieve for people? What are we hoping will be the outcome of the work that we do with offenders? And what does it really mean to achieve true behavior change and some of those long-term public safety outcomes that we've been talking about, as opposed to just compliance with whatever terms of supervision someone is under while they're involved with the court? So we have with us today Jennifer Luther, who's a research associate at the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute, which is one of the preeminent research institutions in the country around criminology, effective corrections practices, and several of the counties here have worked with UCCI around training for probation officers and other cr criminal justice professionals. And Jennifer's going to talk to us a little bit today about what do we know around the research and effective practices that are going to help us achieve true long-term behavior change with the offenders that we work with. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm very glad to be here today. I'm going to start my timer so I don't talk too much. And in thinking about coming here, I thought, well, why, why is it that they want to listen to me? Is it because I work for this premier research institute that's all fancy and stuff? Um, probably not. <laughs> that probably doesn't, doesn't carry as much weight as you would think. Um, Ed said to tell you that it's because I'm an Ed Latessa, only not as funny. So there's from him. Um, and so I was talking with one of the planners here, and I thought, you know, maybe it's helpful to know who is this chick up here and, and what is she all about? And maybe it would be uh, of interest to you to know why I'm here and why I decided to work in criminal justice. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of background about myself before I get started. 20 years ago, I was a college dropout because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, one night coming home from work in my front yard, um, I was with my boyfriend and there was a gang of young men um, looking for a victim. There was a gang initiation. And I was robbed uh, that night and shot with a gun. And I struggled for my life and I almost died a couple of times in that process and spent uh, two and a half years in physical therapy, learning how to use my left hand again. I was shot in the left arm. And I lay there during my healing process and I asked myself some very important questions. Why does a kid have a gun out there trying to shoot people? Why, why is he shooting me? I'm a nice person. Go shoot someone mean. <laughs> And so I started doing some research, and I started doing some volunteer work, and I started working with at-risk kids, fourth graders. And I went into the school in a, a very poor area of Tallahassee, and it was one of those places where the paint was peeling off the walls, and they didn't have enough money for books and pencils and paper and things like that. The teacher was a friend of mine, and he, he encouraged me to share my story with these kids. My scars from the surgery were still fresh and pink, and um, I told them what had happened to me. And something really magical happened. They opened up to me with stories of their own, of the violence that they lived with every day. And one little fourth grade boy, I'll never forget him, said that he had seen his father shot dead in, in their kitchen and that he uh, wanted a gun for Christmas. Wow. You know? Wow. You listen to that, and it really changes you forever. And so I went on this little journey to figure out, hey, what's going on in our crazy world? What can I do if I'm not a part of the solution, I'm sort of a part of the problem by default. And so I went back to school and I got my degree and I started working for the Department of Juvenile Justice at, in Florida. And I started an after school program 
and I worked in all different kind of capacities, but I still didn't really have the answer, the answer why. And what I came to found out, find out, I, I, I recognized that, hey, this is normalized for these kids, this is what they know, and that's why they're out there doing it, but what's the solution? What, what can we do to make a difference? And I can't adopt all these kids, you know, and take them home with me even though I kind of wanted to. That's not possible. And so I worked in and around the system for about 10 years, and then I went to a motivational interviewing training. And I sat there in that room and I thought, okay, now we're getting somewhere. This stuff makes sense. And then two weeks later, I was in a, an aggression replacement training with, with Barry Gluck. And I was like, okay, now I can see another piece. And about a month later, I got to be trained by Juliana Tamans in Thinking for a Change. And so the pieces started coming together. And I saw the picture that I, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to dedicate my life to. So I got to work with systems all over Florida, and that was great. And I was um, getting trained in this stuff, and I was training other people in this stuff. And then I got to run groups. And so I got to actually try it out. And to see these kids being transformed with such a small amount of effort on my part told me, yeah, this isn't just something kind of cool and, and trick that we can do, but this really has the potential to change people's lives. And so I'm going to share some stuff with you today about sort of my vision. Some of it's, uh, I'm going to do R&R &R real quick, so if you've heard it a million times, I apologize for that. Um, but I'm going to go through R&R &R because that's sort of the cake, and then I'm going to lay some new frosting on it for you, hopefully. And I'm going to share some stuff with you that uh, comes from a publication that Ed and I did together that is in press. So no one's read it yet. So you'll get to see some new stuff. Oh, and by the way, Ed told me to tell you that uh, California is doing a great job and that we're very pleased with all the, the things we've seen you guys do. And the projects I've worked on here have been very impressive. So... Kudos to, to the people in this room for all the work you've been doing, and I've been very impressed to hear the presenters up till now. So here it is. We've seen it a million times, <clears throat> right? We gotta figure out who, and we gotta use an actuary uh, risk assessment instrument. It needs to be a fifth generation assessment. It needs to have those dynamic factors in it, and we know what those are. And, you know, really sort of when people ask me what I do, I go, I, I start to tell them, and I say, it's a simple recipe. If we do these things, we're going to make a change. But doing them is a little more complicated, right? So we figure out who, we figure out what, those criminogenic needs, and then we want to use CBT approaches. That's the how. And we have some specific responsivity issues as well that I'm going to talk about. And why is it that we want to keep the low riskers out of the system? You know, what, what is it about them that's going to get harmed? Why is it that if we put a low risk person in, if we do anything with them in criminal justice, we make them worse? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. We're mixing them up with those um, people who are high risk, right, that are going to teach them all kind of new fancy tricks on crimes they can do. So that's not going to work very well. There's the labeling effect as well. And then we're removing them from those protective factors, those good things in their lives, right? Their jobs, their school, um, their family, the things that, that protect them from being high risk. So for those reasons, we, we really want to focus our interventions on the moderate and high. And then we have these uh, criminogenic target areas. And you know what you see, we think a lot about these. We think a lot about these in relation to what we can do to develop new um, modalities to be helpful to the field. And one of the things I really love about working for a, a, a university system is that we care about the field. We're not out to make a dime. We're out to uh, develop things that will be useful to you and your staff in, um, in being able to do the best job you can. So we have uh, developed a substance abuse curriculum. Um, we've now developed a sex offender curriculum, and I have also developed a family intervention that is delivered by officers, so parole and pro probation officers primarily. 
Although I think that that's going to move into the, cor the corrections system to the prison system and probably be delivered by officers there. So we want to util utilize the resources we have to be able to meet these, these areas the best we can. And then, you know, here, here it is in the black and white. General responsivity says use CBT. And when we go in and measure programs, we look at all of their treatment modalities and we decide, is that CBT or is that not CBT? And I'm going to break down what, what helps us make that decision. So if you ever want to know what kind of results you're going to get on a CPC or a CPAI, you're going to, you're going to get some hints today on that. And then we want to be able to be very specific to who that person is in front of us. So what is their culture? What is their gender? What is their motivation level? Um, what is their temperament? And those things I feel are best suited uh, with motivational interviewing specifically, and certainly cultural awareness. Here it is, folks, the iceberg. So what do we do? Well, we see the actions, we see the crime, and we sort of in the past have stayed also on the surface of the water, right? We've done things that are actions in response to actions, but we have not dug underneath the surface of the water and we have not found out what is underneath there that's causing these actions. What, what, what are the values that are driving this person? And if we don't know that stuff, we're never going to be able to do our jobs. And I'll tell you this, as I've listened to tapes of or observed people doing CBT, officers doing CBT, treatment providers doing CBT, one of the things that I feel is often lacking, even though we know this stuff in our heads, they never really get to what's under the surface of the water. They never actually effectively mine for the thoughts, the feelings, and the attitudes and beliefs that are there. And then they don't effectively find a target behavior. And then, and then what do you do with your intervention if you don't have a target behavior? You have to have that. And so this is a, a difficult and skillful piece to being effective in evidence-based practice. So I sort of like to compare this to the medical model, right? You go into the doctor, you got a little cold, your doctor says, you know what, I don't want to hear anything about what's wrong with you, I don't need to know, here's this silver bullet, here's this pill, it's a magic pill, it's going to take care of everything, right? That's what happens and you go, okay, great, you take the pill. That would not be good, right? You would prefer that your doctor actually find out. It's your throat, it's your knee, it's your arm. You want your doctor to find out what, what's wrong with you first. And then you want them to do something that's specific for that. And that's exactly the same thing that we're talking about here. We, we want to be able to find out exactly what it is that's driving this person's behavior and then do something effective towards that. You know, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statistics and slides. This one shows clearly if we just use, if we just use criminal sanctions that the results we're going to get are in the negative. We're going to increase recidivism with that. But if we use treatment modalities and we use the principles of effective intervention, then we are going to be able to reduce recidivism significantly. So here's our recipe. This is a simple thing. All you have to do, you could actually get up and leave after this slide. Just do that and you'll be fine, okay? <laughs> there it is. That collaborative relationship is in there. That's a big, hard thing to get folks to do, isn't it? All by itself, just pick out that one bullet and just try and do that. That's hard. And it also works for violent offenders. So CBT, Reduct reductions in reoffending by 19%, all other interventions 1%. So it's, it, it, it's hard to know all this stuff and turn away from it. You, you have to say to yourself, we really have to make sure we're doing this and we have to make sure we're doing it the best way we can because that's the kind of stuff right there that prevents future victims, right? That, and that's what we want. We want safer communities, but we also want these folks to have successful lives that don't include criminal behavior. 
you know, I mean, I just want to pause for a second here, and, and, and I'm thinking about the day that I was in court, and I did testify. And I didn't know exactly what I would feel that day. I went in the courtroom. A lot of people knew me in Tallahassee. I was a fairly well-known uh, person in the city and, and loved. And so there were a lot of people there to support me. And I didn't know much about the court system. I didn't know that it's sort of like a wedding where the the guests of the bride and the guests of the groom sit on different sides, right? So you have like the, the prosecution and the defense on these two sides. And so I got there and there's the whole prosecution side is filled up with all these faces of these people that loved me and cared about me. And I really didn't know what I would think when I saw this guy for the first time, you know? Would I be scared? Would I be ter terrified, you know, even? And I, I was called to the, to the stand, and I looked out, and here was this young man. He looked so scared, and he was there with his court-appointed attorney. There was no one there sitting next to him. He was there all by himself with his court-appointed attorney. The entire other side of the room was packed. And about halfway through my testimony, a woman came in the back door and she looked at him, she looked at the room, and she looked at both sides. And I knew, she, I knew she was his mother. I could tell because there was a family resemblance, and she looked freaked out, and she was, in fact, his mother. I was right. And you know what she did? She slipped into the back of the prosecution side quietly and sat down. And in that moment, a little piece of my heart broke for this kid, you know? I felt that he should be held accountable. Uh, I don't be mistaken on that. And, I, and I, I came to the stand with the honest intention of telling what happened that night. Um, but still, this was, this was his life. And after some time, I was able to figure out where he lived and the cir more circumstances about him. And it was pretty sad. So, you know, I, I think about that today and I think about how alone some of these people are in the world and how much support we have and how sometimes we in the criminal justice world are the only people that they know that are sort of pro-social, hopefully we're pro-social mostly. And, you know, have that supportive and collaborative mindset that we can offer them something different. And I'm gonna close today with a little story about um, something more about this whole idea. So let me talk a little bit now about what you want. Well, first of all, I'm a curriculum developer. It's one of the things I do. So when I'm talking about these curricula, um, I'm one of the, the lead writers on them. And we have this specific responsivity, and we have this general responsivity, and we think about, okay, we want to use MI, and we want to use T4C, and we want to use these CBT um, interventions. But one of the things that I feel like happens in agencies is that it sort of becomes this piecemeal quilt, and officers and, and, and people delivering them sort of go, well, how does this fit together with this, right? This is contradicting that. And so, um, I think a lot about how to integrate them, and we certainly have thought about that in developing our uh, interventions. And I have a book chapter coming out on the topic of integrating MI and CBT, so I'm happy to share that more about that with you if you want, specifically in criminal justice. And so, we, so when I think about this, I think about two different types of models. One is a sequential model. So first we're gonna do something, and this is ideal for a group intervention. First we're gonna do something to raise your motivation. And you can also think about this when, people, when folks come in to um, get assessed or they're coming into the system for the first time, they're coming into your program for the first time, they're coming into probation for the first time. You wanna do things that are consistent with raising their motivation to see the value of engaging in the services that you're gonna provide, whether that's getting off probation quickly or um, learning something that can be helpful to them in the future. And then we wanna 
next thing we're going to do is we're going to address thinking, okay? That's the very next part. So we're going to use some tools, some specific tools for that. We're going to use behavior chains. We're going to use thinking reports. And if you, if you try to get the sales pitch that a conversation is a cognitive behavioral intervention, don't buy that. That's not a cognitive behavioral intervention. A conversation is not. There should be some practical tools in there that take these concepts and break them down. And then we're going to use some emo emotional regulation interventions that combine both the cognitive and the behavioral aspects of CBT. Then we're going to address some skill deficits there next. And those are going to happen with behavioral rehearsal. So one of the things I'm going to look for if I end up being an evaluator at your program and I go into a group or I go into a one-on-one -on -one session is, is there role play happening there? And you know how much the officers love role play, right? It's like one of their favorite things to do. <laughs> they love it. I always joke with them, it's okay, you don't have to role play. You model, they role play. And then we're going to um, take it to a little bit higher level, and that's going to be problem solving. So a higher level type of social skill problem solving. You can pretty much use that with everything. And then we're going to do some relapse prevention planning, which I've renamed success planning because I like the positive aspect of that. So this is a sequential model. You do these things, you do them in this order. Then we have sort of a more integrative approach where you're really moving in and out of that motivational interviewing style based on what's needed. So somebody might get sort of into the emotional regulation pieces and say, you know what, this is where I get stuck. This is where I, I, I feel like I have no control. I don't know if I want to engage in this. I don't know if I want to try these, these uh, tools. And so we would move back into MI there. And so we'd be very cognizant of where's the person at and when is the need for the MI style to come out more um, pointedly. The other thing I would do always with this integrative approach is make sure if you're going to try for integrative approach that your officers are getting or whoever's delivering the interventions are getting coaching on both MI and CBT in conjunction with each other. And I did a very cool project recently with Multnomah County, Oregon, where I did coaching and they were using our EPICS model. Some of you are familiar with it. And they were also trained in MI, and so the coaching was really MI within the CBT approach. And that um, yielded a lot of benefits for them. They could see how these two things fit together nicely. And so all along the way, coaching, feedback, change planning. I don't know why that slide did that. That was cool. Oh, it didn't do it again. All right. So... We've got this MI stuff, and what is this? You know, sometimes you'll, I'll go out and I'll, I'll go to agencies and they'll say, we're trained in MI, okay? But then when you ask, then they'll say, well, okay, um, they'll raise their hand and they'll say, um, Jennifer, so what do I do if somebody doesn't want to participate? <laughs> like, use MI. <laughs> you said you were trained in it. <laughs> use it. So being trained in MI does not always equal being trained in MI. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what kinds of things you should be looking for in trainers and what kinds of things you should be looking for when you're integrating and when you're implementing these approaches. But this is our working definition of MI. And MI is not the behavior, the stages of change. And MI is not just reflective listening. It's not just saying, so what I hear you saying is, no, it's an actual thorough approach where we're looking for change talk and we're doing specific things with that. Because what we know is that when people, when I articulate the reasons why it's important for me to change, those things get stronger in me, right? And when somebody comes along and says, here's why you should change, this is what you should do to change, I'm more likely to become defensive. I'm more likely to get my hackles up and say, no, 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 that's not going to work for me. And guess what I'm articulating then? the reasons why I can't change. And so MI really focuses on decreasing what we call sustained talk, reasons to stay the same, and increasing change talk because that shows effects. What we say is important. What we think is important and what we say is important. What we tell other people is important. 
And then we have cognitive restructuring. And as I said, this should be a tool. I put the three steps on there from, from cognitive self-change, thinking for a change. All cognitive restructuring should include these. And this stuff works great with me. One of the reasons why I'm a believer is because I use this stuff with myself. You know, I sit there on, on a Sunday morning with my cup of coffee and I think, what are you thinking right now, Jen? Is this thought helpful to you? If you keep thinking this way, where are you likely to end up? Those are questions I, I can ask myself. And actually, based on cognitive restructuring, I feel like I am more successful in my life. I do things that I may not have done if I'd kept just telling myself that, oh, you can't do that. That's not going to work, right? So I pay attention to my own thoughts. And when I train people, I often have them use these tools with themselves. Because if you have a personal experience with it and it works, that's going to make a huge difference in how you could then communicate it to the offender, right? So it should be a specific tool there. Then we get to the lovely behavioral skill building approach. And we got to be, they got to be motivated to try it, so we have to increase motivation. We got to be able to normalize it too. You know, I'll, I'll have officers tell me, oh, they, they're not going to do this. I can't get a group of uh, sex offenders to um, role play, no way. Or parents of juveniles on parole. But I never had a problem. Never had a problem. Never had anyone say they wouldn't do it. Because I just go in and normalize it. This is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to look. And guess what? They jump aboard. So um, being able to, to, to present these to people in a way that allows them the freedom to try them. They got to know what to do, and they got to know when to do it, and then they got to be proficient. And that means that they got to do it a lot, a lot of times, a lot of role plays. Because here's the little thing that it says above there. Skill deficit is often a maintaining condition to problem behavior. What does that mean? If the only thing I know how to do is punch you in the face if you call my mama a name, guess what I'm going to do every time you call my mama a name? I'm going to punch you in the face. That's my only skill set. That's all I know. So we wonder, we, we, sit, so we sit back and we wonder, why do they keep doing that? They keep, they keep getting in trouble over and over again, even though they know. They know that they're going to get in trouble for that because they don't know what else to do. we got to teach them that. And we're going to teach them that in steps. And we're going to break it down. And we're going to practice it. We're going to practice it in the safety of our offices. We're going to practice it in the safety of our agencies. And then they're going to go out and do it, try it in the real world. And then we're going to help them problem solve what worked and what didn't. So here's what I had said earlier. Conversation's not enough. They need more. They need to see you do it. They need to try it out. They need to get some positive feedback and reinforcement. And then they need to, to try it in more difficult and challenging situations and try it out uh, at home or try it in the, on the mod or wherever they are. You know, one of the things that I put, I, we talk about, you know, you can't, you can't learn to ride a bike by looking at a bike or watching someone ride a bike, right? You got to actually hop on the bike and try it. That's the only way you're going to learn how to ride a bike. And so this is what we want them to do. We want them to actually walk through the steps and try it out. And I think also I added on here playing the piano because one of the things that I love that Bill Miller one of the authors of Motivational Interviewing says is learning MI is like learning to play the piano. You can't just go to a one-day workshop and now you're a concert pianist, right? You have, to, you have to do this a lot. You have to have a teacher. You have to have someone telling you, hold your fingers this way, try it that way. You get feedback and you practice a lot. So when we think about these skills, whether they be skills that we want our staff to, to acquire or skills that we want the offenders to have, we have to think about practice, 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 practice. Lots of coaching, lots of feedback, lots of reinforcement. Those are the things that are going to matter. Those are the things that are going to help them be proficient. So I'm going to um, transition now to some of what I call the icing. Um, hopefully all that stuff I just said you'd already heard before. <laughs> and 
I want to talk about the, the fidelity principle. What should programs do to support this? First of all, you got to observe the treatment approaches. You've got to, if you're a supervisor, if you're a project manager, if you're a director, you got to figure out how to make this procedure and put it in place where there's regular fidelity monitoring happening. And they should be using a standardized tool. And they should be giving that feedback immediately afterwards to the person who delivered the intervention. And the feedback should be strength-based and elicitive. So I have some, uh, I'm happy to provide you with anything you want that I have, but I have a very organized way that I've developed feedback to be structured that meets both of those um, parts and pieces. They should be change planning. You don't just get your feedback and go, okay, thanks. No, it's what do you, so what do you want to work on next? What are you going to do to improve? What are some steps you can take? When are you going to start taking those steps? There's change planning involved. It's not just feedback and that's the end of it. What are they going to do to improve? How are they going to meet those challenges? And I'm going to ask them for that. And then we want to be able to provide the cognitive, the high fidelity cognitive behavioral intervention with relapse prevention or success planning, as I like to call it, and booster sessions. We want to be able to develop relationships with our community providers. You know, and as I talk to officers around the country, one of the things that they'll tell me is, I kind of already know which referral agencies are good and which aren't because my offenders come back and tell me, right? And you sort of know that too. But are we going into these community-based agencies and are we looking at what their treatment modalities look like? Are we seeing if they're doing role playing? Are, are we seeing if they're doing cog restructuring? Are we seeing if they're developing collaborative relationships? How are we measuring that? And then are we going to hold them accountable for that? Are we going to say, hey, you know, there's, there's some way in which we can structure our resources to give more resources to those that are doing high fidelity CBT, that are adhering to the principles of effective intervention. So we want to be able to monitor those. And then we have to relate to them in interpersonal ways. We have to be able to have a relationship. If I, if I think that everything I say, you're going to jump all over me, I'm not going to tell you the truth about what I'm really thinking and feeling. And if you don't know the truth about what I'm really thinking and feeling, how are you ever going to help me make a change? So we have to have that doorway and we have to have those skills in place. And I, and I, and I feel like one of the things that, I, that I've recommended often, there's a tool, a free tool, called the Officer Responses Questionnaire. And it has specific vignettes. So let's say an offender said to you, um, you know, I can't stop using because I live with my brother and he uses every day. What do you say back? And then based on what they say back, they get a score for that. That's the kind of tool I would use to hire new staff, right? Because if you ask somebody, are you empathetic, what are they going to say? Uh-huh. <laughs> How do they know what that is, though, right? So I want to know, are they really able to interact in an empathetic way? So I'd encourage you to think about when you're hiring new people, using some kind of a vignette that's applicable for you to measure what would their response really look like. And then, you know, base it on their ability to, to relate. I have one last little uh, slide for you that's a, that's a research-based thing. And this comes from a study that Ed did um, here this, in this year, 2013. And it was, it was looking at our EPICS research. And for those that were using high fidelity um, CBT, specifically in this case, EPICS, they were able to uh, keep their incarceration rates at about 20 percent. Uh, I'm sorry, reduce them by 35 percent. I'm reading the chart all wrong. No, re no, keep them at 20. Look at that. I'm a researcher. Can you tell? That. Um, and then if it was low fidelity, they had higher incarceration rates. So it's not enough to just say we trained our staff and now they're good to go, but are they doing it and are they doing it well? So how do I figure out who to hire as a trainer? That's a really big question. And this, 
this sort of makes me crazy because this is, this is my own like going around and listening to what people have told me around the, around the country. First of all, I would hire someone who works exclusively in criminal justice. Don't throw somebody in with a whole bunch of officers that doesn't understand officers, right? Because what are they going to do? Eat them for breakfast. So use somebody who works exclusively in criminal justice that understands criminal justice. Make sure that they have a plan, that this trainer, before you hire them, make sure that they have a plan for building internal capacity. If all they want to do is keep training you and charging you, uh-uh, that's not good enough. They should have a plan for how they're going to make your folks able to take over their job. That's a good trainer, right? Making, making it to where they don't have a job anymore. Steer away from those train and pray approaches. Scares me to death when I hear people saying, well, we had a one-day training and there were 50 people in there and now we're all MI trained. If they, if they want a skill, if they're doing a skill-based training and they're doing it in one day with more than 25 people, run away from that. That's not, that's not, you might as well not even try. You might as well not even do it. So they should have coaching involved. Let me ask you this. Raise your hand if you were trained in MI. All right, lots of hands. How many people were trained in MI and had at least five coaching sessions after that where they gave f feedback and, you, and they sampled your work? So a lot less hands, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about here. If, you're just gonna, if you just want to throw your money away, then don't do the coaching piece. Just do the training piece. But what happens, I just was doing training in Ashtabula County with my family program right before I came here yesterday. And the, the director said, you know, we're all on this training high right now. And so we're all excited and we're all fired up about what we can do to impact families. And thank goodness this isn't the end. Because what happens is we get on this high and then you guys leave and then that's the end of it, right? And the coaching model that I developed for that is very exciting. Guess what the coach does? They go out to the family's home with the officer and the supervisor, and they actually deliver the intervention in front of the officer. That's a pretty cool training model, right? Now we're not in a classroom anymore. We're actually with real clients out there. And they get to watch that as many times as they want, and then they're going to try it. The coach is going to give them feedback, and all along getting the supervisor ready to be in that coaching role. So those are the kind of things you want to hear from a trainer that you're thinking about hiring. Try and find non-proprietary materials. If you've got to buy materials, a workbook for every single person, that gets expensive. There are some really great materials out there that you don't have to buy. You can have them for free. Find those. Prioritize those. Make sure that your trainer has a, re has a conversation with you about what's a realistic and specific goal for an outcome for this training. You want, to have that, you want to hear them having that conversation with you, and you want to have that be a part of the big picture. Organizational change takes time. If you're just starting down this road, give yourself two years before people start even accepting that this is what you're going to do now, and then another two years before they get good at it. These things take time. Expect that. Okay, so what about trainees? You wouldn't believe how many times I go into a training and they'll say, well, I'm actually retiring in three weeks. Why are you here? Go home. You know, you don't care. Or I haven't really told a lot of people this at work, but I'm leaving the agency. Great. I don't really want to deal with you for the next four days. So think about who you're selecting. Do they want to do it? Have they some ability? Have they some sense of what it means to be a change agent? Are they committed to staying with you, right? And do they have time to perform these tasks in their current job? Don't train people in things that they don't have then time to do. You're wasting your resources. We want to save money. All right, this is the final little piece here. I think I'm doing good on time. Yeah, I'm doing good on time. When you're thinking about how do you support this 
internally. You want to make sure that there are clear objectives and that these are a part of your strategic plan. Think about your plan for the year. Think about your plan for the next two years. Don't just spend out your end of the year funds. Do something strategic. The most important supports you'll find are your middle managers. They're the ones that have the power to make or break your interventions. We used to make a joke in Florida about top down, bottom up, smush them in the middle. Get those middle managers aboard. They are your boots on the ground. They're so key. If they're on, on your page, if they're on your team, you can do great things. Do as much before the training happens as you possibly can. Do pre-training. Have people engage in tasks. Have them, be, have them be a part of the planning of the process. You wouldn't believe how many times I've also shown up and had people say, I just found out this morning that I had to be here for the next four days. You know, they weren't real happy with me. And I'm like, what, where did the ball get dropped? Somewhere along the way, no one told this person, or a slot opened up and it was a last minute thing. So do as much before the training to get people excited, but also to get them engaged in the material. And there are all kinds of interesting things you can do to, to do that beforehand. Make sure that your policies and your procedures and your paperwork are supporting it also. So ha you know, try to hire trainers that have some idea about that or some sort of consultant that knows a little bit about systems and can help you make sure that this is going to line up in a smooth way with what you're already doing. Put those quality assurance processes in place. You've got to have them. There's no reason to do this stuff if you're not doing it well. And then also just coaching, 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 coaching. I want to say one thing in closing. Sometimes you just never know what you do, if what you do makes a difference. And sometimes we will never know. You know, we do all these things and we want them to be um, significant. We want to make the world a better place and a safer place, but you just don't know. And I had a really neat thing happen to me just this year. Seven years ago, um, when I was running the aggression replacement training group, I had a young lady in that group who had some serious um, challenges in her life. And I worked with her a, a, actually more than just in the group. So we met at the library sometimes, and I helped her with job applications, and we had lots of conversations one-on-one -on -one as well as in the group. And then we lost touch because, you know, I went away and life went on. And um, this year, just a few months ago, she found me on LinkedIn. And so she emailed me on LinkedIn. And she said, Miss Jennifer, I'm so excited to f have found you. You will never know the difference that you made for my life. You are the only person that ever told me Kiki, I believe in you. You can do it. And because of that, I never got arrested again. I graduated from high school. I got a driver's license, the first person in her family to get a driver's license. And I'm going to college for the first, first person to ever go to college. I'm, I'm starting this year. She's, she's all signed up and ready to go. And it's because you believed in me, and that made me believe in me. And so I hope for you that you can also have these kinds of experiences where we believe in them and then we see some successes. Thank you.